hello, hello. So I wanted to answer the question, why is natural tanning, why is tanning so confusing, so difficult to understand, so complex, and so difficult to learn? I just wanted to touch on that just a little bit, tackle that question, okay? Um, so for one, you know, before we even start, it's good to remember that, um, you know, so say my own, my own tanning practice, um, I tend to call it like natural tanning is kind of a category I, I use. Um, and what I mean by that is tanning, I'm tanning in such a way that um, humans may have been tanning uh, for maybe 40,000 years or at least 10,000 years or who knows. Um, for very far back in the human story. Um, and some of my personal ideals are things like not using any store-bought products as much as possible or completely um, and having those tanning practices be very land-based or place-based, people might say, um, so that my animal species and my plant species and my materials are coming specifically and directly from the landscape where I'm in and harmonious to that landscape. Um, so that's just kind of the world of tanning that's my interest, uh, you know, sometimes a huge passion and obsession. Um, that's that, you know, over here. And then there is perhaps on the opposite end of that spectrum, if we make that a spectrum, you know, we have modern day, uh, large scale commercial chemical tanning, right? Which, um, you know, is using very, very strong chemicals, uh, doing things with very different methods and very large scale, very mechanized. Um, it's a very product driven market. Um, and it has its own particular methods and ingredients and science behind it kind of put it over here and then you know in between those two sides those two poles you know we might actually have all these different kind of hybrids or in between stages of those um, which would be like different at home methods or methods that can translate to small scale that vary from um, old to new, you know, and some of those things might be like, like, I might put, <laughs> I can't figure out my directions here, um, if this is natural tanning or ancient tanning, um, you know, there's like alum tanning is a thing, which is like kind of natural, alum comes from the ground, I think, I think it's mined, I don't really understand alum or what it is, but it's something you buy at the store. You like buy little containers of it and use it at, at home. You know, and then there's things like glycerin tanning, where you if you buy a product, um, it glycerin. It's like a byproduct of the production of vegetable oil. I think I don't quite understand it. Um, but it's something you you can buy and then you can use at home in your tanning practice. And then there's other um, at-home chemical tanning methods, which can involve all different kinds of products, um, which I guess the aim is to make the tanning easier, less labor intensive, to speed it up, to come out with softer leathers, you know, things like that. Um, so even on the personal at-home level, uh, and likewise, like I said, like like I didn't say, you know, there's some people who try to look at modern large scale commercial tanning practices, try to kind of translate some of those behaviors and actions and methods. Say, oh, how can we translate some of that into small scale and do it home? So, you know, already we've got a huge spectrum here, really a, a literal Pandora's box. Of like, okay, we can't just say tanning. Like, what do you mean when you say tanning, right? Do you mean like what our ancestors were doing 10,000 years ago? What large scale 
extremely polluting um, uh, uh, manufacturing, leather manufacturing facilities we're doing now, and then all the stuff in between. You know, so where do you even where do you even begin? So that's one reason for the confusion, right? Um, so people who do tan, even if it's people, someone who's like tanning in a tradition that's kind of a lineage for them in a way, like maybe something they learned from their dad or their grandfather or their uncle, that's like a particular way folks have tanned a few hides here and there in their family, which maybe relies on a certain product or a bunch of salt or something. Um, and that's how they're used to doing it. To them, that's what tanning is. That's the way you tan. You know, and to someone else um, who's maybe just learned buckskin and they have a tradition of uh, brain tan buckskin. And like to them, that's what tanning is. And to someone else who's maybe more on the spectrum of like interested in taxidermy and these very um, modern chemical methods. You know, they have all these special tools and all these special chemicals and to them, that's what tanning is, right? Um, so thus, if you ask a question like, what, how do you, how do I tan this raccoon? How do I tan this Martin? You know, you're going to get a bazillion and one answers. And when you're learning, that can make you want to bang your head against the table or the wall. Certainly when I was learning, it was a massive impasse for me. When I wanted to learn fur tanning, I couldn't find, I mean, I was maybe, I didn't know how to access the resources that did exist. Because clearly there are other people like me now. There's other people who do natural fur tanning, and I just wasn't plugged into those worlds. Um, so in my region where I was, which was the Mid-Atlantic, um, part of the U.S., which is where I'm back at now, um, I could not find any teachers, for one. I looked very hard, <laughs> could not find any good classes, um, could not find any books. And to my knowledge, there are no books that exist on natural fur tanning to any, to any real extent. Um, other, other than, uh, what's her name? Uh, Rom, oh, I gotta remember. Um, they're Scandinavian. I can't believe I can't remember her name. She's got a few books, um, and I've never gotten to get a hold of them. Um, but even if I did, they're not quite what I needed. So, you know, when I was first starting to learn, try to figure out, wrap my head around tanning and fur tanning beyond just buckskin, you know, I probably did, like, go on YouTube here and there, and just be like, what are people saying? And it was a goddamn nightmare. And to this day, I would I have never gone back to the internet for for tanning, <laughs> and I I would be I would be terrified too. Um, like oh my god, it's got to be just a mess. I mean, since then there is a lot of good stuff. Now there's a lot of natural tanners who now have Instagrams and put their stuff online, and that's really cool. Um, but in terms of like if you're opening the Pandora's box of planet Earth on YouTube, like how do you I tan of this? I mean, you're gonna get every single response in the name of God. Like, and some of it, I'm gonna tell you, some of it, possibly 80% of it, it's just gonna be lunacy, you know? And, um, yeah, I don't even wanna go into some of the crazy stuff I've seen, um, particularly men. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it out right now. I'm gonna lay it out. Um, it's unfortunate, but to me, it has been fact that if you are trying to learn tanning and um, it's a man who's trying to explain to you how to do it, um, like 90% of the time, me personally, I'm assuming that they don't know what they're talking about. That's unfortunate, but that was my reality, okay? So I was a woman trying to learn tanning and teach myself how to tan. And there were classes in my region there were folks in my region who claimed to do fur tanning and to know how to do fur tanning. Um, you know, the trick is when somebody says that, like, oh, I tan first, I tan. You gotta be able to see the hide, ask for a hide, right? 
you know, you got to be able to see and touch and smell something they've tanned. Like, where's the proof? You know, before I spend my time listening to you, uh, the proof is in the pudding, man. You know, like, let me see that hide. Um, in my own case, none of these people could produce a hide for me to actually see. And if they did, you know, oh my God, it was like mostly might as well just have been raw hide. <laughs> like stiff, crunchy, hair falling out, like just not, you know, nothing even close to on the spectrum to a garment quality, naturally tanned fur. Um, you know, and there, there's even, there are classes even nowadays, and there were, you know, when I was learning on like brain tanning furs, like, like primitive skills schools, things like that. And like brain tanning furs. Um, clearly there's got to be some really great ones out there. Most of the regions where I have been, however, it's, you know, it might be a one day class that probably amounts to like, you have a skin, don't even dry it, just skin an animal, rub an egg on there, and yank on it all day until it ends up dry and kind of crunchy, kind of flexible, and hold it up for the camera with the first side, first side, so the camera can see, can't see the back. <laughs> like, okay, you know, great. You know, anyone, anyone could figure that out on their own. Um, it's just not, I don't think it's very helpful. So, oh. so why is, why is tanning so difficult and confusing. Well, for me, I brought this book for you all to see. It's one of my favorite books on hide garments. It's called Spirit of Siberia. Um, and it's by Jill, I don't really know how to say their names, Jill Oakes and Rick Rue. <laughs> R-I-E-W-E. -E. Um, if you Google it, you'll find this book, Spirit of Siberia. It's wonderful. There are a number of books out there on um, far northern traditions of uh, hide work. This is one of them. And, you know, it took me as just a learner and an explorer of life and tanning. It took me quite a while to realize that Traditionally on planet Earth, this is the work of the grandmothers, okay? Like this is the magic and the mastery of the grandmothers of humanity on Earth. Um, let me just show you. So this book, so there's a grandmother, there she is right there. Uh, in Siberia, so this is like the far northern band of land, uh, what's now like Russia, um, but that huge swath of, of land of all of Siberia to the far east. Many, many, many different tribes throughout there, but all reindeer, reindeer people, um, similar to uh, Scandinavia, um, and also very similar in culture to that same band of land um, in North America too, right? So Inuit cultures as well. All these sort of far northern bands of cultures, a lot of similarities in, uh, uh, in culture. Because they have a very similar climate and probably a very similar uh, ancestry in, the, in terms of the movement of people over the world. So there's the grandmother with her sewing bag. It's a magical object with all these charms on it. Because in that bag is everything she needs to create the garments for the whole family and the whole village. Um, highly skilled, highly detailed garments made from the reindeer hides that they tan themselves by hand, usually on their laps. Because these are nomadic people. All their tools are small hand tools, usually sewn into the inside of their garments so they don't lose them. Because they're nomads. And... This is a place where garments are make the difference between life and death, right? So in these extreme northern climates, you see some of the most 
most intricate, most skilled, most awesome traditions of garment making and hide work on planet Earth is in the very cold regions. Also because, you know, there's less and less plant life throughout the year. Like, you know, the further away from the equator you get, or it's a land of ice and snow, you know, human life depends more and more and more and more on animal, right? Instead of animal and plant, right? So, you know, it's like not even plant fibers. It's like all the fibers are from skin or from sinew and things like that because animal is life, okay? Um, uh, gosh, it's gonna be hard for you guys to see this. There's another grandmother sewing. It's amazing. So this is all, you know, this is all women. Throughout most of the history of the world, tanning, so animal dismemberment, butchering, the preparation and storage of the meat, the food, the organs, the fat, the tanning of the hides, the creation of the garments, has for the most part, overall, been the domain and the mastery of women. And these works are massive. These are massive undertakings. They require extreme skill, so much labor. Here's another woman. She's scraping a hide on her lap, like with this hand scraper she has working on her lap, which is incredible. Like no big frame, you know, no big operation. And, you know, they're making garments that are so soft, so floppy, so wearable, and so warm for the whole, um, for the whole community. So there they are again. I could show you pictures all day, but I won't. There they are with their reindeer, right? Wearing reindeer parkas, so these garments here. The kids are wearing reindeer. Pretty much everything. <laughs> I look so happy. Okay, so I'm telling you all this, first of all, just to give us pause. Okay. There's some boots. Like, this ain't no slap together shit, you know? Like, oh, we just like kill an animal and chew on the hide a little bit till it's soft and wear it. No, like this is a level of artistry and mastery and detail that leaves the modern world, puts the modern world to shame to shame, right? And these are, so it's just good to remember that traditions like this, human hide tanning traditions and garment traditions, oh my God, you know, could be thousands and thousands, but honestly tens of thousands of years old of an unbroken, evolving lineage of a people living in a certain place, in a certain climate, with certain species of animals, certain species of plants, certain seasons, for countless, truly countless generations, right? Knowing how to tan those hides, knowing how to live in every way, all the applications of using those animals, right? For, for all the applications, even other and beyond garments, okay? You know, our world kind of wants that, oh, well, how do you tan a hide? What's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, right? This should be a simple mechanical process, scientific process. And I think it is extremely folly of us. I think it's reflective of the shrinking of the mind and the spirit that our modern world cultivates with regards to natural things, with, with regards to ways of living on the earth. Right? That when, when a culture like this passes away, meaning all the elders are killed, or their language is lost, 
through any of the myriad applications, any of the myriad um, methods of genocide, which, near, which nearly every indigenous group on the face of the earth has endured. Some survived through, some limped through, and some perished, many perished. When a tradition, an intact tradition like this perishes, what is lost? Our modern world cannot even, our modern world doesn't even possess the senses. We possess them. They're just, they're just not quite awake. The senses to feel the impact of that loss, of how massive of a loss that is. Okay, we can't just be like, oh, snap our fingers, one, two, three. It was a primitive thing. It had to have been simple. How do you tan a reindeer hide? I'm sure we can figure it out, make some garments. You know. I mean, what hubris, what folly, right, to think that tens of thousands of years of human genius, ingenuity, wisdom, profound, profound wisdom and awakeness and skill and profound heart-based connection to all that lives over stone, snow, water, animal, sinew, what hubris for us to think that our modern world can ever have a leg up on that. It can't. Our modern world is so impoverished, is, is cripplingly impoverished in that way. Okay, so I say that for one, to give us pause to understand that so many of the Hyde traditions on this earth have been lost. Like the curtains came down. Night has fallen. Okay, and even if there are what we call them, what is it, like a museum and artifacts, artifacts or any remnants of something left that we can study and look at. You know, for the most part, leather is not, it's not like in the fossil record. You know, it, it deteriorates. It's just not, you know, it's not like stone tools where you can find remnants from so long ago and piece together how people did it, right? So it is worthy of us taking pause to appreciate, perhaps feel this, feel as much as we can, even if it's just a little bit, the impact, the bottomless grief, right? Of, for example, here in North America, within what are now the bounds of the United States, I don't know of a single intact Hyde tradition that survived within what is now the bounds of the United States that is still practiced by those people here on this land. Um, I have been told that there are intact traditions um, in what is now Canada where certain, certain tribes like still are able to teach their children and generation by generation still have in some intact hide work, you know, animal dismemberment and hide work traditions. And as far as I know, I, I have not become aware of any um, in what's now the United States. Um, most reservations and most communities, indigenous communities in the U.S., um, At least, you know, those that I've had direct or indirect contact with, like, look for people to come in and teach hide tanning or to sort of reconnect, reconnect some, some of those skills, some of those traditions, which, so that's a whole other really complicated and, and dynamic topic, which is just really bizarre. Um, but overall, I say that to say one of the reasons tanning seems like such a Pandora's box. It seems like there's a million methods and ways to do it and people 
could say completely different, sometimes contradictory things about how to do it. One of the reasons is because probably over the history and face of the world, like there has been a million and one trillion billion methods for treating animal skins to come out with a material of any number of so many different kinds of materials for any number of reasons and uses. That diversity is awesome in an awing kind of way. And predominantly, I think it's based upon region. It's based upon place, okay? The climate where you are, the particular animal species that live where you live, the plant species that live where you live, you know, like the wetness, the dryness, the temperature, all of that of a particular place is going to impact how you can tan, how best to tan, what kind of garments hold up the best are the most functional. And this changes dramatically, climate to climate, place to place. So on one, on one way, that can be mind boggling. Okay, like the way I can tan here in the southeast, so different from like the southwest, which is really dry and can be very hot and very cold. Here, climate is a bit more mild and much more damp. Uh, the humidity overall all year long, much higher. Okay, so how you can treat skins, so different, even just in those two places, right? The availability of water, the vegetation, you know, brain tanning makes a lot more sense in those dry climates. And there's less vegetation and there's less water available to do vegetable tanning. Vegetable tanning makes a lot more sense in the eastern forests where there's a lot of water available, there's a lot of plants available, and the humidity is so high all the time that mildew is a major problem. Right? Vegetable tan hides hold up over time much better to humidity and mildew than brain tan does. So, um, epic diversity, okay? Our modern industrialized world wants to put everything in a box. Step one, step two, step three. If we can just use these really strong chemicals, we can do the process anywhere. We can import and export the process anywhere. <laughs> Fuck that shit, okay? You know, like, the reason these processes are natural is because they are wedded to a place, to an ecosystem. They, they, it is an ancient marriage with roots so deep and so mystical into that place, that soil, those trees, those animal species. Our modern approach, the modern simplistic approach can never feign or recreate that and the beauty of it, okay? So I'm just uh, putting it in some context, giving some perspective here. I'm just widening the perspective. I'll just show you. Tanning is absolutely a Pandora's box. Even within tanning, just the side that's natural tanning or ancestral tanning is a Pandora's box in and of itself. Oh my gosh, right? I mean, I have a lot of friends who tanned sheep hides. I can't really get them so much here in the Southeast, um, but I've been able to handle sheep hides um, from many different friends from different parts of the country. You know, and it's amazing. Sheep hides, some of them, and some from certain regions, like you don't even have to tan them. You just leave them out in the rain or let them dry and just kind of shake them a little bit. And they're like soft as butter, which is crazy. And then there's sheep hides from other climates, raised in other places. I don't know, like different genetics in the sheep, different lifestyle, different stuff they're eating. That like you could tan it three times and it's still hard and stiff and it's crunchy. So the, you know, unbelievable variation. Just like where the hide came from, what part, what region that sheep lived in. That's very humbling. <laughs> it can make your brain water explode. You know, if you're a natural tanner trying to learn. Um, you know, fortunately I spent, fortunately or unfortunately, I spent like two years writing a book on natural tanning from my own experience and perspective. And it's true what people say, that writing a book will teach you how much you know and don't know about a thing. Oh my god, 
Like, I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown every three days, you know? I would write about everything I believed to be true about natural tanning that I had seen and worked out in my own process. Like, I'm writing, I go tan, I go back to writing, I go tan, talk to another tanner. Oh my god, one conversation with another natural tanner. And I feel like my head's going to explode, you know? My self-esteem just plummets. I feel like all my understanding flies out the window because everything they've just said and the hides they've shown me go against everything that I've experienced in my work. And, like, they just throw my own rules out the window. So don't be surprised if that happens. You know, if you get into tanning and then you talk to another natural tanner, if they're in the same region as you, particularly if they're in a different region, prepare to have your brain explode. And um, it took me a long time and a lot of um, life crises to understand that I truly believe that is part of the nature of this craft. Uh, it's extremely chimerical. It's a Pandora's box. The diversity is mind-boggling. Um, so I invite you to kind of accept that as a property of this art form itself. Instead of trying to fight against that, you can, there's still ways to find the truth of method. But if you approach this more like alchemy, because it is alchemy, right? It's an art form about process and about decay and death and transformation and transformation after death. This truly is alchemy, which is halfway magic. It's a science, it's a magic, it's an art form. Um, and it has realms that are of the physical and the non-physical. Both. Spinning together. It's real. It's real. Okay, so why tanning is so confusing? Another thing is that, like, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who will just lie to you. Or, I don't know. I don't want to get into it too much, but I think that at least modern American culture now, this revival of like this fetishization of living in the wild and the reality TV, sh you know, I've never actually seen one, but just my, my gauge is that, you know, like the reality, the nature survival reality TV show emergence, like that that is even a thing in our culture and popular and something that can make money tells me that there's this great fetishization of, uh, and fetishization means like a removal, a distance, a lack of understanding, a lack of intimacy with, with nature. Um, uh, and the way that our culture seems to do it, the only way it seems to know how to do it is with a warlike mentality. Okay, so if I admit I've never actually watched any of these shows, but it's my understanding that some of them you know, like, they'll take a person like me, like, oh, you know some Earth girls, and, like, dump me on some random place in the world, you know, like Costa Rica or some place in Africa or just, like, some tropical climate or something, the middle of a jungle that I've never been with a thousand, thousands of species of plants I've never met before. I've never met any of those species of animals. I don't know the clay there. I don't know the water. I don't know the climate. I don't, right? And expect that person to survive feed themselves, survive. Okay, like, I've been studying the plants, particularly, more than everything else, of the eastern forests of this continent my whole life. The southeastern and mid-Atlantic, specifically, ecosystems of this place my whole life. Maybe I have a fingernail's worth knowledge and understanding about them all and, and, and even coming to food right the the nuances of like all the plant harvests and the way to harvest them and process them and make them edible and store them it's a hundred million billion encyclopedias of the human mind and spirit that's why it takes tens of thousands of years for cultures to mature that are place-based right Take me and plot me in a place where I don't, I don't have relationships, long-term relationships with those plants and animals. That's insane that a human should be expected to just like figure out how to survive, right? 
the only situation in which that would be the case on planet Earth, that a human would find themselves in that situation, is one war. A soldier plopped in the middle of Vietnam, right? Some totally different environment they've never been in, and they've got to just figure out how to survive, right? Because they're there for war. Or, I want or, a slave trade, right? Where a human is plucked from one place on the planet where they have grown roots for 10,000 years. And they're plucked, you know? They're plucked from the Congo, and they're plucked in, you know, what's now Georgia, in the United States, right? To grow cotton, like, all, everything's different. Those are the only two situations I can think of where a human would find themselves in that situation. Okay, that our culture fetishizes connection to nature through that lens, either of those two lenses. Boy, does that reveal the warlike character of this culture. That 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 colors the lens through which we see everything. In particular, the Earth. Um, and so with tanning, you know, our culture thinks, oh, it's primitive, it's ancient, it should be simple. Simple. It's for survival. Pull a skin off an animal, and you should just chew on it and soften it up, and you can wear it and survive, right? It's not about the grandmothers. <laughs> Every single itty-bitty stitch depending on the season, what they can make their thread out of, whether they have to cut thin fish skin and twist it into thread, or whether it's sinew, the way the sinew is braided into these beautiful braids to store in their craft bags, or every tool is beautiful and unique tribe to tribe. Unbelievable beauty, unbelievable complexity extraordinary time and attention and love. Okay. I say let that be your muse. You know, if you feel called to hide craft. They have been mine. They have been mine. Um, for me, li living and learning in a place that is very devoid of culture, of lineage, of connections to something that's ancient and in our blood in our DNA and in our spirits right? is, is hide work and and this ancient relationship and marriage to the animals to a place to those mountains those trees all those things um, right so that I say that say in our culture I do think particularly men can get can feel the pressure like oh to feel competent, because we all must feel so incompetent. I feel incompetent in every way myself as a product of this culture about how to live. I have been trying to learn how to live my whole life here. Right. So the agony and the pressure we must all feel. And I think particularly men feel a certain version of that pressure, which has got to be intense. So with tanning, sometimes, can just feel like, oh, even if they don't know how to do it, just muscle through it and pretend and tell other people how to do it so that they seem like they know. Right? So it's a grief on both sides. It's a grief for the folks who have to do that, and it's a grief for the folks who, who are trying to learn. Right? It's, just, it's just grief all the way around. It's not really anybody's fault. There's a lot more to this topic, but I just wanted I wanted it to be sobering, to be some perspective. You know, even you know, some of the greatest high traditions in the world, like I said, are on that northern band around the globe. Inuit, Scandinavia, Siberia, the Far East. And the things that can be done in that climate, which maybe never gets above freezing, don't translate to what you can do with hides here. 
Like for hides there, they might even be just mechanically manipulating them, like raw hide that's essentially just softened without any fats in it, pure fat or emulsified fats, right? Because the hides like stay preserved in a way they never would in temperatures above freezing. And the way that, you know, we could tan hides here, you know, like with the fats in them, like if there's oil in a hide, like it would freeze solid in those climates and be stiff and hard, right? So it's just, it's extreme, the differences of how skin can be treated and held up in different climates, extreme, right? And a lot of those places when people are using tannins, they're like shredding bark by hand, getting it juicy and like smearing it directly on skin, like rubbing bark on skin instead of like in a warmer climate here, like having a barrel of water, of liquid. There is no liquid water up there, it'd be frozen, right? And you're like putting bark in water and then putting a skin in the water, right? Totally different even though it's both like using plant tannins, right? Extremely different approach. Um, yeah, and what sophistication. That's what I want to get across. Like, the methods of the people of the earth, all over the earth, no matter where. Our modern culture calls it primitive, which is belittling. Right? It's simpler. It writes it off. Simple. What humans did in the past was simple, and we just keep evolving and getting more complex. You know, now we're smarter than we ever were before. This, this is what sophistication truly is, right? It's not trying to conquer nature, force things to become what we want them to become. We're gonna force this hide to become soft and the color we want it to be by using chemicals that are strong as fuck that are killing us all at the same time and killing all the life around us. No, true sophistication is the marriage and the skill and the emotional skill and the physical skill and the mental skill and the spiritual skill and connection of being married to that landscape and knowing how to do all the things that landscape with just the materials that are there. Not just in a do no harm kind of way, but in a, the diversity of the entire place is increased and is bettered by the doing and by the living of those people there. And all species thrive and the human population thrives. And if life is difficult, it's happy. And those humans are successful and robust people the invitation. Ah, here's my little ramble for today. Tanning is amazing. It's a Pandora's box. Even I would go so far as to say a spiritual practice. Get this book. It's a good one. Um, wish I could remember some of the names of the other ones. They're about reindeer. Until for now. Bye bye.